Hi, welcome to Acton Public Access Television. This is Virginia DeBoer and we're here now to support the veterans and to listen to some speakers and to honor our veterans of today, the past, and the future. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Paul veterans and invited guests. My name is Joe Armstrong, and the President of Rolling Thunder Main. Thank you for joining us today as we pause to remember our POWs, MIAs, from all past laws that have given up their freedom for us. Today's ceremony is being brought to you by Rolling Thunder Main in cooperation with the Sacred Veterans Memorial Committee. As a reminder, on the first note of the National Anthem, veterans may now wear their hands soon if so desired. The band should place your right hand over the house. After the last note of the National Anthem, all rounds will be given. We ask that all cellular phones and pages be turned off at this time. Mike Aston, that's the music. Our day three hour of DC color guys. The police post the colors, followed by the play of our National Anthem. Father, your own son was a prisoner, condemned he died for us, victorious he returned to us to bring us the gift of life everlasting. Comfort us now in our longing for the return of prisoners of war and those missing in action. Help us, Father, inspire us to remove the obstacles. Give courage to those who know the truth to speak out. Grant wisdom, wisdom to the negotiators and compassion to the jailers. Inspire the media to speak out as loudly as they have in the past. Protect those who seek in secret and help them to succeed. Show us the tools to do their will. God bless those in captivity, their families, and those who work for their release. Let them come home soon. Thank you, Father. Amen. This commemoration is set aside to honor the commitment and the sacrifices made by this nation's prisoners of war and those that are still missing in action. 
as well as their family. By custom, it is often observed in the Pentagon ceremony on the third Friday of September. Until July 18, 1979, no commemoration was held to honor the POWs and MIAs. In the first year, Congress passed resolutions in the National Senate ceremony was held at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. The first tactical squadron, flying on the Air Force Base, was made up to move the missing man formation. A poster was published by the Veterans Administration, which contained only the letters CFW and MIA. And that continued until 1982, when a black and white drawing of a POW in captivity was used to show the urgency of the situation. Every year, National POW MIA Recognition Day, legislation was in group introduced until 1985, when Congress determined that commemorative days would no longer be considered. The President now signed a proclamation each year. The National League of Families proposed the third Friday in September as a date for the commemoration. Most of the National POW MIA Recognition Day ceremonies have been placed at the Pentagon. Now, ceremonies are held throughout the nation and around the world on military installations, ships, schools, churches, etc. The focus is to ensure that America remembers its responsibility to stand behind those who serve our country and make sure that we do all that is possible to account for those that have not returned. Before I introduce our invited guests, I'd like to recognize two very special guests that will be honored here today. Mr. Vernon Boulay, uh, the Springdale, former World War II POW. Mr. Alice Milgan, wife of former World War II POW, Kenneth Milgan, Mr. Chief. At this time, I wanted to introduce our invited guest, our next speaker. Major General Stephen E. Nichols, United States Army, retired. <laughs> Main State Senator John Courtney. <laughs> Major Michael Steinbacher, Main National Guard. <laughs> Ms. Sandy Kell, President, Gold Star Wives, Bureau of Captain Maine. Robert Freelance, Chairman, Sanford Springdale Veterans Memorial Committee. Ms. Andrea Bowman, State Representative, State of Maine. I'd also like to take a moment and recognize and thank the commanders of the Sanford Veterans Organization for being here today. Representing the VFW, Post Commander Paul Rose. Representing the GAV, Post Commander Richard Brunel. Representing the American Legion, Post Commander Bob Bahoo. <laughs> Representing the Ambex Post, John Telcat. <laughs> Before we go to our speakers, I'd like to ask Major Steinbacher to please come up forward and say a few words and make a special presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. I'd like to say that it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm both honored and humbled to have uh, been asked to present two State of Maine Silver Star Honorary Award Medals to two POW veterans. Uh, of course, to Alice, on behalf of your husband, and Senator Lieutenant Bullard, on behalf of yourself, sir. It's an honor and privilege to be here. I'd also like to ask I'd like the officials to assist me in doing that, so I'll get to that now. Senator Courtney, you come forward, sir. The Silver Star Honorable Service Medal, Attention Awards, is presented to Second Lieutenant Vern Bowlby in recognition of his honorable service as a prisoner of war during World War II and for his service in the armed forces of our country. We, the citizens of the state of Maine, express our sincere appreciation for his courage, 
and his willingness to serve both our state and nation. We are proud of him and grateful to him for his commitment to the defense of freedom. Signed, Governor of the State of Maine, John E. Baldacci, Adjutant General, State of Maine, Major General John W. Libby. for his courage and his willingness to serve both our state and nation. We are proud of him and grateful to him for his commitment to the defense of freedom. Signed, Governor of the State of Maine, John E. Baldacci, Adjutant General of the State of Maine, John W. Lee. Washington, 
the husbands and wives who will never grow old together, whose children will never know their parents, or whose parents will all live their child. On this day, I ask that you remember those still missing, and that each of you in your own way pray for their return. Today and every day, all Americans should say, we remember and we are grateful. For freedom, truly, is not free. Thank you. This time I'd like to ask Ms. Sandy Gallup, President of Gold Star Live, Zero Captain Lee, to come forward. Thank you, Joe, and thank you to all of the members of Rolling Thunder and the Veterans Committee who put forth the effort to bring us together today, lest we forget. Imagine if we could encourage every man, woman, and child from the town of Stamford to gather here for this occasion. How far out into the streets would they flow? And then let's imagine that we invite all of the people from Benefit, every man, woman, and child, and then let's add Saga. And then let's throw in Scarborough. Can you imagine how many people that would be? Well, all of those residents would not total the number of people who have served our country and never come home to American soil. Today we honor all POW MIAs from all laws. But there is a gold star widow living in South Paris, Maine, who sent me a poem that she wrote in honor of her husband. He was not a POW MIA, he was a Vietnam vet who later died from service connection. And I've selected some words from her poem, which is called, God Bless Vietnam Veterans. God bless our veterans throughout the USA. Forgotten heroes of our wars, we honor them today. So eager, young, and innocent, they heard their country call. They left behind their loved ones, prepared to give their all. Each heart was filled with fear, knowing that death was lurking near. The horrors that they saw are locked within their souls. To the USA, these men returned, no welcome, no bands played, no hometown celebrations, no ticker tape parades. Their hearts were wounded. No one seemed to understand their agony or the pain they endured. We can stand beside the Vietnam Wall and almost feel the wretched pain. Reach out today and thank a vet. Some of you may remember that last year I spoke to you about the gratitude campaign, which is a way that you can say thank you to a vet without uttering a word. Whether you're walking in the airport and see troops, or walking down the mall and see someone with a service cap on, all you have to do is give them the gratitude salute. So to all of you veterans here today, I say to you, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. This time I'd like to invite Sir John Courtney to accept all the safety awards. Thank you, For me, it's always humbling to get up in front of uh, veterans and I look at 
my World War II veteran friends over there, and uh, I often wonder what's this young fellow from Sanford doing standing up talking in front of them, he should be sitting down listening. And quite frankly, the only reason that I can even get up in, in front of all of you is because I think that it's so important that our elected officials continue to keep the memory alive. And it's my small way of paying tribute to those of you who have served and those of you who are keeping the memory of those who have served and have come home. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. And, uh, thank you for this honor once again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to ask the State Representative Andre Wallen to please come and say a few words. Hi, folks. Thanks for welcoming me here today. It's, as I must have said, it's rather a humbling thing to be here before those of you who have given so much and whose loved ones have given so much. As, as some of you may know that. My husband was a Vietnam vet. He's since died of cancer. He died at home in the loving care of family and the folks at the hospital. I can't imagine how heartbreaking it must be to know that a loved one has died far away and not know for certain where and how they'll actually return. So I just want to thank those of you who like others across the country that may not be visible today to us. Share the faith, keep the memory alive. And uh, on behalf of the state of Maine, as Senator Courtney said, I thank you all for your service and thank you for welcoming me and also. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker, but before I do, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this gentleman. Major General Stephen E. Nichols, United States Army retired, was born and raised in Riverside, Rhode Island on January 12, 1930. After graduating from Dunworth, Kansas High School, he entered the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. General Nichols graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1952 with the Commission of the Second Lieutenant of Infantry and awarded a Bachelor of Science degree. Wounded in action in Korea while a platoon leader with the Bonnier Infantry Division, later he commanded a weapons company of the 82nd Airborne Division. General Nichols served in Vietnam for the 173rd Airborne Brigade and later commanded the Infantry Battalion of the 196th Light Infantry Brigade in Vietnam. He also commanded a mechanized brigade in the 4th Infantry Division mechanized at Fort Carson, Colorado. General Nichols was assigned to staff duties in France, Belgium, Belgium, and Germany before being assigned as commanding general, Army Readiness and Mobilization Region 5. His last assignment was at, as National Intelligence Officer for General Purpose Forces with the National Intelligence Council. He has resided in Washington, Maine since November 1987 with his wife, Carolyn. He is currently the chairman of the Board of Maine Veterans Homes and president of the 4th and chapter number 92 of the Military Order of World Wars. His decorations include the United States Distinguished Service Medal, National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit with two Oakley Clusters, Bronze Star with V for Valor device, the Air Medal, Joint Service Combination Medal with Oakley Cluster, Army Combination Medal with Oakley Cluster, Purple Heart and Combat Infantry Badge, second award. It is a great pleasure to introduce Major General Stephen E. Nichols, United States Army, retired. Yes, veterans, friends. Today we take time to remember those who are listed as POW or MIA. For many Americans, 
even though the Bay Army is the field that is the families of MIAs, the victims tend to be anonymous. We know about the plight and seriousness of the situation. But most often, we don't know them or how they ended up their names on a list. Today, I'd like to try to shed a little light on the identity of a few POW MIAs and some who narrowly risk becoming POWs and how they get caught up in their several circumstances so that we can remember them as individuals and not as part of a faceless, nameless mass. These are soldiers who I am now, or my close to. The memories of the awful conditions of the Civil War prison camp at Andersonville, Georgia, have long since faded from our consciousness. But many of us still have vivid recollections of acquaintances who during World War II suffered an access to prisoner of war camp. During our first major action in World War II against Nazi forces in North Africa, we suffered a tactical defeat at Kassarine Pass in Tunisia. Because of poor leadership and inexperience, many Americans were captured by the German armored units. One American soldier who became a POW is Raymond Lyson, who now lives in Washington. Ray was sent to a star in Germany with a rough treatment and a poor diet, reduced him to a mere shadow of his former self. He lived to be liberated. And even now, is in poor health. Later in the war, during the Battle of the Gulf, a young infantry scout named Edmund Moore was captured by the attacking Nazi armored forces as they smashed through the frozen Ardennes forest in a surprise attack. He was lucky as a Ray Rising. He escaped after just a couple of weeks and returned to American lines. Escape may not be the proper term. Ed is a pretty feisty little guy. And it's possible that the Germans simply let him go just to be rid of it. His experience shows, however, that it is sometimes possible to avoid a long imprisonment by being alert to opportunities for escape. Ed Moore's was recalled to active duty in the 1950s and fought in the Californian conflict. He was careful to avoid capture during that hard war. In Korea, in 1953, a rifle platoon was ordered to conduct a raid against a position occupied by a Chinese infantry company. They went right away, and after a lively exchange, we withdrew. At a rally point, we conducted a roll call and found that there was one soldier missing, PMC Murphy. Now, Murphy was not an exemplary soldier, but he was one of ours. So I told him to go to Saddle Up because we were going back among the Chinese to rescue Murphy. We held to the tradition that no man was left behind. Before we could get started back up the hill, there was a lot of movement at the extreme end of one of the Chinese trenches. It was Murphy. He escaped the POW experience by tossing hard hand grenades, and we avoided the necessity of going back to deal again with a company of Chinese whom we had seriously antagonized. Years later in Vietnam, a young communications soldier left this company to lay a wire to the battalion headquarters. When he did not return to his company within a reasonable time, a search party was organized to look for him. Followed his footprints along the jungle path until he saw them mixed with the several footprints made by sandals, typically worn by the Vietnam. No other trace of the soldier was ever found, nor was a saint ever observed. During operation by another battalion of the same brigade, the unit deployed at a site where a bridge had been destroyed. The head count disclosed that a soldier was missing. The company commander concluded that the missing soldier had lain down to sleep at a previous rest stop and had not awakened when the battalion resumed its march. As you can imagine, there was some serious consternation in the missing soldier's company. 
and indeed throughout the battalion. A life of the tomb was ordered to return to the site of the previous home, and there they found the missing soldier. Still asleep. This man might be blessed with an incredibly good luck. It's a universal truth in all the earth of the United States service that we leave no man behind. And yet, we continue to encounter circumstances during which soldiers are lost. A pilot shot down over Iraq, a soldier in Afghanistan who wanders off by himself, unarmed, without telling anyone where he's going. We agonize over these unfortunate, unfortunate victims of war. But as we remember all those who are missing from the roles that they given, we should remember that each one of that number is an individual, a family, hopes and aspirations, and we hope for the future among us, the lucky ones. And today we do that. We remember. Thank you. Thank you, General. On National POW, I want to get recognition day. We honor the brave and patriotic Americans who were held prisoner of war. We remember those still missing in action for their valor and selfless devotion to protect the country they love. Our nation owes them a debt we can never fully repay. On this day, we underscore our commitment and pledge to those who are still missing in action and to their families that we will not rest until we have achieved the lowest possible accounting of every member of our armed forces missing in the line of duty. Today, there are over 88,000 Americans listed as missing and unaccounted for from our nation wars going back to the beginning of World War II. That's 88,000 military and civilian men and women, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters. World War II officially ended over 60 years ago. A war for America, that for America lasted less than four years, that claimed more than 400,000 American lives. So more than 130,000 Americans taken prisoner of war. And a war that continues to which more than 78,000 Americans are missing in action. Five years later, America found itself at war, this time in Korea. And in three bloody years, more than 35,000 Americans died. More than 7,100 were taken captive, and more than 8,100 continue to be listed as missing in action. Then came the 11 year involvement in Vietnam, a war that resulted in more than 58,000 American deaths almost 800 POWs, and more than 2,500 missing and unaccounted for Americans. A number that is now nearing 1,750 because of the tremendous search and rescue, correction, search and recovery efforts of the U.S. government, especially the joint POW and OIA Accounting Command. As we pause to remember their sacrifice today, we must also remember the sacrifices that the families of the missing continue to make. Continue to make. It's true that the cost of war extends far beyond the last shot fight. And for the NIA family, the passage of time does not heal their wounds. For them, the days become weak, the weeks become months, their years, and now sadly decades. I cannot imagine the daily loss I would feel if my mother or father had gone to war and did not return. I cannot imagine reliving the moment that the government couldn't tell me if my brother or sister was alive or dead. I cannot imagine the emotion if that missing person was my son or daughter. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what the families have to live with, day in and day out. They want and deserve answers to questions where they may be done are slow in coming. They're not asking unreasonable questions. None of their families have a different agenda. All they want to know is what happened to their loved ones. That is not too much 
for them to ask, and that is not too much for our government to answer, or for other governments to help us answer. Today, this nation reaffirms its resolve to achieve the fullest possible accounting of those that are missing. As veterans and family members of veterans, we too must do our part to remember their service and sacrifice. Seek out a former POW and the families of the missing in your community. Ask them to publicly tell their story so that our children and their children will understand the service and sacrifice that you find when America calls upon the military. Teach them about World War II, about a time when a nation of 133 million citizens put 16 million of them in uniform to help save the world from tyranny. Teach them about Korea, the Forgotten War, but one just as brutal as any conflict in this nation's history. Teach them about Vietnam, about how the nation turned its back on an entire generation of soldiers because its citizens couldn't disassociate the war from the warrior. Teach them about Operation Desert Storm, the first Gulf War, when America vowed to never again turn its back on its warriors when America regained its pride for those who wear the uniform in our country. And teach them about the brave men and women who continue to serve in harm's way in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. People that put others before themselves is the story of America. The America that rose to greatness on the shoulders of ordinary citizens who refused to shirk the responsibility of citizenship, some of whom paid the highest price to preserve, preserve the peace and freedom others to enjoy. At this time, I'd like to draw your attention to our displays to my immediate right and explain what each one represents. On our far right, we have a missing man table. This table is set for one small, which symbolizes the frailty of one prisoner against the president. The tablecloth is white, which symbolizes the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose that displays in the vase reminds us of families and loved ones of our brothers and sisters in arms who keep faith awaiting their return. The red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbon worn on the lapels and breasts of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting for our missing. A slice of lemon is placed on the plate to remind us of their bitter faith. They salt upon the bread bowl, symbolic of the family's tears as they wait. The glass is inverted, they cannot toast with us today. The chair, the chair is empty, they are not here with us. To the far left, the tiger cage. This cage portrayed here is a replica of what was used by the North Vietnam Army to transport POWs to permanent facilities. These cages were used to humiliate and degrade the POWs and often resulted in the POWs being spat upon, injured, and sometimes killed. The fallen hero memorial on the soldier's cross. The helmet and dog tags are there to help us remember our fallen soldier. The inverted rifle signals a time for prayer, a break in the action to pay tribute to our fallen soldier. The boots represent the final arch of the last battle for our fallen soldier. At this time, I would like to conduct the roll call of our missing. Lieutenant Malcolm Arthur Abore, United States Navy, hometown, Allwell, Maine. State missing, July 18th, 1965, South Vietnam. I answer for him. Specialist E4, John Henry Ralph Brooks, United States Army, Ryan Con Lane, Made Missing, May 13th, 1969, South Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. Captain Carl Russell Kircher, United States Air Force, Bethel Lane. Missing May 3rd, 1970, 
North Vietnam. I'll answer for him. Such a P4 wicked flag starting. U.S. Army, Gold Fox Crop Navy. Missing November 3rd, 1970, South Vietnam. I'll answer for him. Lance Corporal, Glenn Cole, we died on United States Marine Corps. Standard Canadian. Missing April 27th, 1967, South Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. First Lieutenant Walter Lewis Hall, United States Army, Old Town, Maine. Missing June 10th, 1965, South Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. Lieutenant Junior Gray, Terrence Higgins Hanley, United States Navy, died in Maine, missing January 1st, 1968, north of Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I am the Ben. First Lieutenant, Jack Rockwood Army, United States Air Force, died in Maine. Missing November 28th, 1972, South Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. Private First Class, John Norman Huntley, United States Army, Portland, Maine. Missing September 27th, 1969, Wales. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. Petty Officer, Secretary Class, Joseph Tony Lucetti, Jr., United States Navy, Paul Corey, Maine, missing September 28, 1967, South Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. Captain William Stephen Sanders, United States Air Force, Winthrop, Maine, missing June 30, 1970, Ohio. I answer for him. Lieutenant Junior Gray, Neil Brooks Taylor, United States Navy, Wayne Green Navy, missing September 14, 1965, South Vietnam. Still missing, sir. I answer for him. Staff Sergeant Peter Judd Valcao, United States Marine Corps, Auburn Navy, February 1st, North Vietnam. I answer for him. I often wonder if our brother is still listening to say something to us. What would that be? I need to go something like this.
time there's 43 cancers and illnesses that the VA will pay compensation for that many veterans have no idea they're eligible for. This we is also a uh, situation where these veterans aren't aware that their diseases and medical problems are associated with their time served in Vietnam. Sometimes it takes 35, 40 years for a lot of these problems to come to the surface and they don't necessarily make that connection. So we try to get in touch with as many veterans as we can and encourage them to get into the VA system and get the necessary physicals and checkups so that we can get them the help that they deserve as soon as possible. As you view or have viewed this ceremony today, please pause. Remember the families that are veterans that have not turned, turned yet. As I stated in my speech, every day they face the reality of not knowing. And it's our purpose, our mission, to make sure that it's kept in the public's focus. It's not only the POW and MIAs that are missing, it also involves all of the family members, of which there are many, that we need to be respectful of. Well, thank you.